Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles, where today Atreus421 is going to be having a bit of a kickabout on the Islands of Ice map in Epicenter game mode in the Japanese Tier 9 torpedo destroyer, the Yugamo. This is a North American server replay, which you should be able to tell, if not by the names of the players involved, but also by the comedy going on in chat. There's soul-ending depression in the USS Vermont on the enemy team. <laughs> and no, I don't know him, but I do love his name. Saying to the friendly Montana, Hey, I'm just like you. Except worse. Well, at least he's got a sense of humour about it. <laughs> Although, to be fair, uh, while it is worse than the Montana in almost every respect, the Vermont does have heavier weight of firepower in its broadside. So there is that. Still, I'd rather have a Montana. Oh wait, I do. And I'm not in any rush whatsoever to get a Vermont. Although I can see the Vermont being useful in competitive, where targets are generally only spotted for a couple of seconds and so you have to make every single shot count. And in those kind of circumstances, being able to unload a bigger weight of firepower onto a target that's only visible for a few seconds is probably very useful. But in all other respects, I'd much rather have a Montana. Continuing the theme of comedy player names, there's a few in this battle, as well as soul-ending depression in the Vermont there, but I think the prize has to go to the captain of the Marlborough on Atreus's team. His name is Drink More Bleach. <laughs> and considering he's in a Marlborough, which means he either had to spend a stupid amount of money or go through the dockyard grind and then is playing the Marlborough, I think his name is incredibly appropriate. Anyway... Let, let's let's concentrate. Start taking this seriously. So, Atreus, Yugamo. He is easily going to have the best stealth of any ship in this battle. He's managed to get his concealment down to a mere five kilometres, which is fantastic. He's going with a smoke screen rather than the torpedo reload booster, which is a common choice among Yugamo captains. The Yugamo is a decent ship. Uh, oh, hang on. Torpedoes already? This early? That must mean the enemy Halland is up ahead. It's the only thing that have gotten here this quickly and launched torpedoes this early. Atreus must be cautious, but he is of course going to spot the Halland long before the Halland spots him. A much more significant and potentially immediate threat are going to be the presence of the two enemy radar cruisers. The enemy team have a Des Moines and a Riga. Which doesn't really seem fair since Atreus's team only have a Worcester. Oh, true, they do have a Neptune, but trust me, the Neptune's not running radar. And while it's true that Atreus' team do technically have one radar, the captain of that Worcester is going to be doing his level best to ensure that no enemy ships ever get within his radar range if he can possibly help it. Well, to be completely fair to the Worcester captain, he is going to attempt to extend down the western flank. Oh, hang on a second, more torpedoes. Is that a battleship I can hear behind you, Atreus? I do believe it's the Prince Ruprecht, yes, and he's eaten almost all of the torpedoes. Atreus is getting the hell out of Dodge, because the postcode currently occupied by that Prince Ruprecht is attracting an awful lot of fire. And that's when the team lose their first ship. The Druid, the Tier 10 destroyer, has gone down. But it's the name of the captain of the Druid that's causing my eyebrows to raise. Maltese Knight? Isn't he an EU live streamer? What's he doing on the North American server? I mean, it might not be the same person. The Maltese Knight I know is a very, very good destroyer player. And, um, well, <laughs> let's just put it this way. If that is him playing on a North American server account, he's probably not going to be sharing this replay anytime soon. First one dead. Oh, well. Happens to the best of us. Oh, speaking of the Worcester, by the way, you can already see him on the western flank attempting to use the islands, and he's going to push a few kilometres further south before he realises, hang on, nobody's following me. I'm feeling very lonely and exposed over here, and then turns around and heads back up to the northern third of the map, where pretty much everybody else on the team, with the exception of Atreus here and the Prince Ruprecht, who just got bitch-slapped by all of those presumably Halland torpedoes, are going to be spending the majority of the rest of this battle. The Prince Ruprecht was very, very brave there, reversing out sideways on in front of all of those enemy guns, considering how little health he had remaining. And honestly, I'm surprised he survived this. 
he pretty much did it to give his secondaries a chance to fire and also to get his torpedoes away. But he has attracted a lot of attention and is continuing to do so. Here's where Atreus does the duty hero thing. He's popping smoke. It's not for him. It's for the Prince Ruprecht, who just took another hit from the enemy Johan of its airstrike. Normally, dropping a smoke screen for a battleship is a bit of a waste of effort due to the battleship's massive smoke firing penalty, but the Prince Ruprecht is capable of thinking and breathing at the same time, which you may find surprising given his performance thus far, and he does realise what's good for him, and is going to thank Atreus in chat. Meanwhile, the enemy team have suffered their first casualty, and it's great news. It's one of the enemy radar cruisers, the Riga. He basically did exactly what the Prince Ruprecht did over here, except he didn't stop and reverse back into cover when he realised what was about to happen to him, and continued to sail out from behind that island over there, with fairly predictable results. The big problem now, of course, is going to be the Des Moines, who is inside radar range. Although, I'm only assuming the Des Moines actually has its radar available, because Atreus was radared earlier. It was quite safe, he was behind the island, nobody could shoot at him. But at the point where the radar was active, only the Riga was inside radar range. So I'm assuming that the Des Moines radar is available, and yet he's not using it. Of course, the fact that the Riga has just given his team radar coverage doesn't mean that the Des Moines didn't use his shorter range but longer duration radar at exactly the same time, spotting absolutely nothing. Just because it's stupid doesn't mean that somebody didn't do it. Either way, the Des Moines has... well, he's managed to avoid the torpedoes that Atreus fired, but he's also blown any opportunity that he might have had to catch Atreus out in open water. The Johan de Witt is sending another airstrike in against the Prince Ruprecht. I don't know if the Prince Ruprecht is actually visible. There are people blind firing the smoke, and the airstrike doesn't appear to have hit anything. I mean, that's kind of like laboratory conditions for the Dutch cruiser airstrike. A large, very slow-moving target. I suspect, judging by the fact that that airstrike did miss such a, well, hard-to-miss target, that the Prince Ruprecht was hidden inside the smoke at the time that the airstrike was launched and just reversed out in order to maybe get some torpedoes away and also exercise his secondaries. The team have just lost another ship. I do have to apologise, by the way. Netherlands, I'm sorry, but your, your cruisers in this game are terrible. And it's not your fault, of course, it's just that Wargaming continue trying to balance them around their gimmicky airstrike, rather than acknowledge the fact that the ships themselves need a bit of a buff. Either way, the Prince Ruprecht definitely took full advantage of that smokescreen. I mean, they were trying to blind fire him, but he had the sense to not use his main battery guns and just rely on his torpedoes and his secondaries, and has managed to avoid most of the incoming fire and recover a fair bit of health in the process. The enemy team is still alarmingly head on points. The battle is, by the way, degenerating into a typical epicenter battle. Just a couple of brave souls in the middle of the map and everybody else. All the way up to the north or all the way down to the south. You can see the Worcester on the minimap has finally realised. I'm being left out to dry here and is now heading north where he's going to spend most of the rest of the battle along with most of the rest of the team. Both teams have just lost another ship each with the enemy team one kill up. Oh, and there's the Halland. Now, ordinarily, you would not want to get into a gunfight with a Halland in, well, nearly anything. <laughs> Definitely not a Japanese destroyer that isn't an Akazuki, a Kitakaze, or a Harugamo. But, ooh, three torpedo hits. That's probably the Heisen. But the Halland appears to be very reluctant. Probably because he's more concerned, not so much about Atreus, but about what Atreus's teammates are going to do to him. And, yep, scratch one Halland. Useful kill. Both teams now have three kills apiece. Oh, I spoke too soon. <laughs> there goes the Prince Ruprecht. <laughs> oh, well, never mind. But yes, the Halland was very reluctant to actually exchange fire with Atreus. And the Yugamo, I do have to say, while it is by no means a gunboat destroyer, it's probably the first Japanese non-gunboat destroyer that doesn't completely suck in a gunfight. I mean, these Japanese 127mm guns have always hit very hard, but they've been hamstrung up until tier 9 by their horribly slow reload and glacial turret rotation speed. 
And while the Yugamo does still have slow turret rotation, of 22 seconds for a full 180 degree turn, it's 4 seconds faster than its tier 8 predecessor, and it's the first Japanese torpedo destroyer that has a gun reload of less than 7 seconds. So while it is by no means a gunboat, it can still sometimes manage to punch above its weight when it comes to getting into a gunfight, but only if the guns are pointed in the correct direction and you don't have to wait for them to turn. It also doesn't hurt if at least somebody else on your team has your back and the destroyer that you're engaged in a gunfight with doesn't want to risk returning fire until it's far too late and he's about to die anyway. And there's the Des Moines radar, timed to coincide with when Atreus was in cover behind the island, although he's not immune to being airstruck. Well, you know, it's missed. <laughs> but hang on, what's the Montana doing? The Montana did just get his second kill. Unfortunately, I think that's given him a false sense of confidence. Either that or he's suffering from a sudden rush of shit to the brain. Dude, what are you doing? Oh dear. Well, that was pointless. All that's done is put the enemy team 350 points ahead. But don't worry, things will get worse. Some useful torpedo hits again, although, sadly, no kills as yet. Not that there's any shortage of enemy ships that are low on health and really do need killing. Like the Ohio over there. Oh, the team have just lost their Neptune. That's put the enemy team nearly 400 points ahead, but don't worry, it's going to get worse. And this is where one of the enemy players in chat remarks on what a great job the Worcester's doing all the way up north there on the B-line where his radar is no use to anybody, but it's not really the Worcester's fault. We saw earlier that he tried to push around the western flank, although admittedly sitting on a flank isn't a great position for a radar cruiser, but there aren't that many useful central positions where you could get the Worcester in unscathed. And when he realised that the rest of his team were all cowering behind the islands 15 kilometres behind him, he just gave it up. Well, the rest of his team, with the exception of Atreus here, and the Prince Ruprecht, who's dead, and the Montana, who's dead, but you get the idea. The Worcester wasn't planning on joining them and throwing his ship away pointlessly. Speaking of which, the team have just lost another ship. Okay, let's let's just pause and take a snapshot here. Well, let's not actually pause it because that Ibuki is dangerously close, but with the loss of the Yoshino, the enemy team are now 600 points ahead and Atreus's team are on less than 200 points. The enemy team are already saying GG in chat, they think it's all over, and this is where the fight back begins. Beginning with the hilariously named Drink More Bleach in the Marlborough, who finally finishes off the Ohio. All eyes on the Ibuki for the moment, however, which is kind of ironic since, well, Atreus is the one actually spotting the Ibuki. And he's deployed his smoke, so at the moment there are no eyes on the Ibuki. He's taken a guess here with his remaining backup torpedo launcher. Pops them in the water based on where he thought the Ibuki was going to be. Now the Ibuki does have its own torpedoes, and as we all know, smoke screens are torpedo magnets. But the Ibuki's torpedoes are rearward facing, and Atreus launched that torpedo salvo at the point where he correctly, as it turned out, guessed that the Ibuki was going to have to manoeuvre in order to get its torpedoes away. So there's his first actual kill, and he's up to just under 100,000 damage. Now the Ibuki may have managed to get the torpedoes away before it was sunk. So... Atreus is not hanging around inside that smokescreen. He pops out just long enough to get fresh eyes. The enemy team are still 600 points ahead and they have a one kill advantage. And if you look at the map, you can see that they're sweeping up on both flanks to envelop the bulk, aside from himself, of Atreus's team. And generally in World of Warships, the team that gets caught in a crossfire is the team that loses. So it is vitally important that Atreus maintains visual contact on as many enemy ships as possible to give his team the opportunity to take them out before they get overwhelmed. Unfortunately for the Johan de Witt, he's decided he's going to lead the charge of the enemy ships coming up here from the southwest, rather than wait for the Sovetsky Soyuz to push up, and he's been punished heavily for it. More good news, the enemy Hindenburg up there to the north just got himself taken out, leaving just the Jutland threatening that cluster of surviving enemy ships from the east. Unfortunately for the Jutland, he was actually caught within hydro range, not radar, hydro range of the Worcester, which means there is absolutely no way he is getting out of there alive and is very likely to become the next victim. Unless, of course, the Johan of it beats him to it. I know the Jutland has gone down, 
and I'm pretty sure the Yohandovit is going to be next. Or maybe the Sovetsky Soyuz. No, the Sovetsky Soyuz manages to not become the next victim, but Yohandovit claims that particular honour. The team are still 500 points behind, however, with five minutes of the battle remaining. You may be sitting there thinking to yourself, this may be the moment where the enemy team might want to chill the hell out, fall back, assume defensive positions and just take the win that their 500 point lead is giving them. You might think that, but I'd argue that that ship sailed quite a few minutes ago. <laughs> For the Sovetsky Soyuz to turn around and disengage, he's going to have to give broadside and he probably ain't going to survive that. But then again, he's just eaten another torpedo and he didn't really survive the consequences of that either. So the enemy team are now down to two ships, the Des Moines and the Vermont. They do still have a greater than 400 point lead with only four and a half minutes of the battle remaining. And admittedly, a ship like the Vermont doesn't go anywhere quickly, but he's still 20 kilometers away from the rest of the surviving ships on Atreus' team, with the exception of Atreus himself. If they want to chase him down and kill him, which they will need to do in order to win this match, both him and the Des Moines, they have an awful lot of distance to cover in order for most of them, with the exception of the Worcester, to get to within shooting range. And there's a lot of island cover on that side of the map. But both the Des Moines and the Vermont keep pushing forward into increasingly heavy enemy firepower when what they need to do in order to win is just not die. Now the Vermont is slow but it's just fast enough and the gap between those islands is just narrow enough that Atreus can't actually get a torpedo solution on him unless two things happen. One, he gets closer than five kilometers and gets spotted by the Vermont, which has happened. And the Vermont's managed to knock out one of his torpedo launchers. But even that wouldn't have been enough if the Vermont had simply continued on the course he was already sailing instead of turning, beaching on the island and making himself an even bigger sit and duck for Atreus's surviving torpedo launcher. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. And it was all going so well. All of which occurred at almost exactly the same time that the Des Moines managed to get himself caught in open water while continuing to push forward for no apparently good reason, getting himself bitch slapped by the San Luis, awarding the San Luis the Kraken Unleashed in the process, which I thought was extremely generous of the Des Moines. Somehow the enemy team managed to snatch defeat from the jewels of victory. I mean, I say somehow. I honestly don't expect anybody to be surprised at these sort of developments by now. It seems to be the way most World of Warships battles end these days. You'll be pleased to hear nothing has changed. <laughs> Congratulations to the four surviving members of Atreus's team. All of them did very, very well. And I hope you enjoyed today's video because that's it for today. As always, take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you next time.